Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Deuteronomy. And the title of this series is entitled Present Truth in Deuteronomy. Now let me see. Deuteronomy was written 1,400 years before Christ. That doesn't quite sound like present truth, does it? Well, let's see, God has ability to predict the future, so he could have given us some present truth a long time ago. In any case, this is lesson number five in that series for October 30th, 2021, entitled, The Stranger in Your Gates. Hmm, that's an interesting title. Let's begin as usual with a word of prayer. Father, we have come gathered here to study together your word, to try to understand the situation that impacted the people of Israel so many years ago, and those marvelous words that um, Moses was able to write under your direction. May we understand them as far as possible, and may we work them into our lives as far as possible with our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You might think that Deuteronomy is one of those Old Testament books that nobody pays much attention to anymore, but I would remind you that Deuteronomy is quoted 44 times in the New Testament. Some passages that are very familiar that you no doubt would know about and maybe you didn't know they came from Deuteronomy. Let's take a look. Jesus himself made this very important statement quoting Deuteronomy as recorded in Mark 12, 29 to 31. Jim? Jesus replied, the most important one is this. Listen, O Israel or listen, Israel, the Lord your God, or our God, is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second most important command commandment is this. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. There is no commandment more important than these two. From the American Bible Society of 1992. <laughs> So now, let's see if we can work on this as we discuss together. What is the relationship between loving God fully and completely and loving our neighbors as ourselves? Jesus went on to say, and let's just let him finish up here, there is no other commandment greater than these. Are we to understand then that the love is the single greatest commandment? Now, I don't have to tell any of you here, who have been around the Adventist Church for a number of years, each of us, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have focused on the Ten Commandments, and rightfully so in some respects, especially, of course, the Fourth Commandment that sets us apart in some respects uh, because of our keeping of the Sabbath. And we've, that we've done that since early in our, in our history. But what are we doing about these two greatest commandments? If these are the greatest, even according to Jesus, shouldn't we prove if we are the final people of God and we are claiming to be his people, shouldn't we be the most loving people on the earth? No, everybody's afraid to comment on that one, huh? Well, I'll comment. I think we are starting to do that somewhat. Okay. And particularly if you look at what our church is doing in places like Ukraine and some of these others, they are actually getting in there, starting out by teaching their kids stuff, and it just gradually grows. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen that before. Well, I can tell you that um, some people that I are very familiar with that work in India yeah. are having great success in a number of villages in rural villages, small rural villages in India by, op, by op conducting uh, vacation Bible schools, except yes. that they, there's quite a bit more than what we would say. It <laughs> just there's a, a lot about health and all kinds of things in their vacation Bible schools, and people are loving it. Interesting thing about India, we've been there since the last 100, 130 years or so. There's even a church named after us in the southern area. My, my wife's relatives were there more than 100 years ago. Yeah, there it is. Yep. Yeah. How do you quantify love? I know how to quantitate some of the other, some of the Ten Commandments, except the Tenth, but how do you define that you have love? 
I was going to check to see if you know when the Sabbath starts and when it ends. Okay, we can do that. That's, that's <laughs> one of the things that we can quantify, but okay. that's not all. Well, if what you asked, if it really were true, then the Pharisees were the best, most loving, wonderful people. <laughs> Right? Well, yeah, come on. I don't think that it was that. A, not, uh, no, no, I mean, if Ten Commandments was everything, then uh, well, these guys would qualify. Yeah. Of the Big time. But, but uh, unfortunately, many t at least many people think that love is a, uh, a warm, fuzzy feeling mm -hmm. rather than a principle. Yeah. If, if it's a principle, then you, it, you're looking at it from a much better angle than a more realistic end angle. Okay, here's the question. When asked about the most important, the greatest commandment, why do you suppose Jesus quoted from Moses? I mean, couldn't he have quoted something else from the Old Testament or just made a proclamation on his own? Well, Moses was the, quote, greatest of the prophets according to yes. Israel. The yes. Israelites at the time, the Jews okay. at the time of Jesus. That's a fair reason. Who inspired Moses? Jesus. Do you think, and I've wondered this, I've asked this, I'm sure even in this, in this group, do you think Moses ever said to any of his disciples, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm sorry, Jesus, thank you. Did Jesus ever say at any time, and by the way, I was the one who said that to, to one of those prophets, I, well, in a way, remember he says, you, there was a Matthew 5, you have heard it said, but I, I'm going to tell you something, di a different s yeah. spin on things. Mm -hmm. So because of the way the Old Testament had been corrupted. Yeah. I think he told the disciples, um, even though it's not written there, about stories of the Old Testament, and he says, before David was, I am. I am. Mm -hmm. right. Before See, Abraham was. Abraham before, was no, yeah. Sorry, sorry. My paraphrase Bible, but well, anyway, before Abraham was, I am. It's, and the pro so. and the Pharisees and they Picked went into stones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What happened also when Moses was? Uh, he saw this bush not burning. Did the Lord say, "I am there too"? Yeah. There you are. I have I have a question for you. I, I've you know I'm. I'm always trying to think outside the box, and maybe I shouldn't, but. Jesus was talking to them either in the temple courtyard or in the chamber where the Sanhedrin met. I, we don't know for sure which. Where did they get the stones to pick up and throw up at him? <laughs> did they keep a supply of stones there just in case somebody come along and they needed a stone? <laughs> I, you know, forgive me for thinking about these. But where, you know, they picked up, it says they picked up stones. From, where do you pick a stone up? From in the courtyard of the temple. Right, you don't have to travel too far. I've not been there, but you know there's stones all well, over. So, but they didn't. Did they all? They all, did. They all go running out looking for stones. Well, he, they sent some kids. He, they had the money. <laughs> go get some stones. Maybe they chased him out, out to where, where the stones there were, were stones to pick up. Okay, and throw. maybe. Well, these commandments we're reading, we've already noticed uh, in in our discussions that Deuteronomy consists of four major sermons or presentations, whatever you choose to call them, that, G that Moses made to the children of Israel while they were camping on the plains across from Jericho. They could see Jericho very clearly across the flooded Jordan. It, it was early in springtime of the year, and so the, the Jordan was probably flooded, but they could see it right across there. So they were, I mean, they were standing on the footstep of the promised land, okay? And what was happening? Well, didn't, uh, they went into a little bit of uh, trying out some other gods? Well, we, we're getting to that, but yeah, that's, a, I mean, think about what Moses is doing. Moses is very carefully trying to write out everything that we have recorded here. And he was not going to live for too long. What he's he's getting ready to turn around, go back the other direction, climb up the mountain and die. Well, we of course need to remember that the chapter and verse divisions and so forth that we think are it's almost sacred were not there in any of those original documents. We have uh, Deuteronomy 9 that we just looked at a little bit. Um, 
goes, just flows right on to Deuteronomy 10. There were no breaks in those original documents. So let's see what Deuteronomy 10 says. Terry? I'm reading verses 1 through 11. Then the Lord said to me, cut two stone tablets like the first ones and make a wooden box to put them in. Now let's interrupt for just a second to where, if you're familiar with this story, you remember and we talked about this last week. Moses came down the mountain. He found them dancing drunk and naked around this golden calf that they were calling Yahweh. The year, here's the golden calf that led us out of Egypt. And I don't know whether he just said, he just complete, was so shocked that he dropped the tablets, but literally the text says he threw them down. And then later he said, here's the broken pieces of your covenant with God. So, I mean, so anyway, here's, wh here's what happened as a result. Carrie? Okay. Come up to me on the mountain and I will write on those tablets what I wrote on the tablets that you broke. And then you are to put them in the box. So I made a box of acacia wood and cut two stone tablets like the first ones and took them up the mountain. Let me interrupt again for a second. I can't forget a cartoon I saw in a religious magazine once and it shows Moses standing there and you can see the people in the background dancing, dunk, dancing, dancing drunk around this golden calf. And he was, you could see he was trying to hold on to these tablets but they have just fallen on the ground, broken into pieces. And the comment at the bottom says, you break all ten at the same time and all you can say is, oops. <laughs> 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 okay, Gary, okay, sorry. And the Lord wrote on those tablets the same words that he had written the first time. The Ten Commandments that he gave you when he spoke from the fire on the day you were gathered at the mountain. The Lord gave me the tablets and I turned and went down the mountain. Then, just as the Lord had commanded, I put them in a box that I had made and they have been there ever since. The Israelites sent out from the wells that belonged to the people of Jacon and went to Masara. There Aaron died and was buried, and his son Eleazar succeeded him as a priest. From there they went to Gadgoda and then on to Jodbatha, a well-watered place. At the mountain the Lord appointed the men of the tribe of Levi to be in charge of the covenant box to serve him as a priest and to pronounce blessings in his name. And these are still their duties. That is why the tribe of Levi received no land as the other tribes did. What they received was the privilege of being the Lord's priests as the Lord your God promised. Okay. I stayed, I stayed on the mountain 40 days and nights as I did the first time. The Lord listened to me once more and agreed not to destroy you. Then he told me to go and lead you so that you could take possession of the land that he had promised to give to your ancestors. And that's from the Good News Bible. It turns out it's very difficult to get to the place where Aaron died. Very difficult. It's a rough mountain. It's a, but I had the privilege of climbing up a mountain not too far away and taking a picture of it with my telephoto lens. So I have a picture of the place that supposedly is the mountain where, where Aaron died. God did not abandon the children of Israel even though they had turned so quickly to idolatry, even while Moses was still up in the mountain. And I, I always stop in my mind and I think about this. That mountain, the one that they think is Mount Sinai, and there, it, it may not be the correct one, but none of those mountains are very high. So here they are at the bottom of the mountain, and you can see the top of the mountain plainly with ordinary eyesight. And there's God's cloud resting up there, and the, and the, and the, and the black that had shaken the whole mountain, and, the, and then they were scared with their faces down in the dirt, and so forth like this, and it's still up there. It's still there, and now they're, they're dancing drunk and naked around a, a fertility cult symbol. And then he had told them to, to have a box to put the, uh, the stones in. Did they ever have any instructions to bring it out every so often and have lessons and study, lesson studies on it? I don't see the only, any record. The only thing I, I, I thought about that, I have to assume that Moses had those things memorized and he, and he you know, repeated it whenever it was necessary. 
I have asked the question many times in the past. It seems like instead of establishing a tent sanctuary out there, they would have been a lot better off to develop a series of bunch of schools to train kids. Um, anyway. Well, obviously, I'm, I'm not trying whatever to happened, they came out still pagan. Yeah. Well, no, after think 40 about, years. was it Josiah? He says, let's clean up this place, let's yeah. go back. And they brought up the books of uh, the law and... Probably guide. Deuteronomy. Right, did, right, right. So, f generations probably went on without them even knowing but the Lord says, it's in there. I've just given it to you. If we're going to come up to, to this eventually in our, in our lesson, series of lessons here, but I can tell you, especially the king, he says, if you have a king, that king is supposed to have a copy of this book and he's supposed to read from it every day. Hmm. How different would the history of Israel have been if they had done that? Yeah. Hmm. I would propose that those schools that you had postulated, that they should have been for the old people like us, <laughs> as what, and not just for the kids. Yes, not just for the kids, yes, I, I would agree. But if, you, if you're talking about a thousand years down the line, if you keep educating the kids, eventually you'll, you'll do okay. Eventually. Well, Moses dropped her, God did not abandon the children of Israel, even though they had turned so quickly to idolatry. Uh, Moses dropped or threw down those first precious tablets of stone on which had been written the Ten Commandments by the finger of God. I don't know. Do you think Moses got to see him write with his finger on the stone? <coughs> I don't know. I, I want to, just one other thing. Uh, everywhere they went, and especially when they crossed over Jordan, go get some stones. Yeah. When your children ask you, tell them what really had happened. So yeah. there was going to be object lesson, you know, right there. Was, you could see these tones reminded the miracle, miraculous way that the Lord had brought them through. So. I, I have a picture long ago now because the Jordan River has been so many people drawing water out of it, it's, it's almost a trickle now. But I have a picture of it back about 1930s and it was in flood stage and that's the way it was at that point in time. I mean, almost that entire valley from Jericho to where they camped was probably flooded with water. Mm -hmm. And remember, specifically, he told them, okay, when you march across the river, in the middle of the river, one person from each tribe is to get a big stone, take it out the other side, and you're supposed to make an altar with those 12 stones. And uh, I wish I could find that altar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, um, Thus he signified God to Moses that their covenant with God, I mean Moses, that their, God to Moses that their covenant had been broken. Uh, um, Charles, you want to read to us about? Yeah, Deuteronomy 9.17. So there is in front of you, I threw the stone tablets down and broke them to pieces. Good news okay. Bible. Okay, let me ask you there. I'm, I'm, lots of interruptions there, I'm sorry. Do you think Moses did that intentionally so they could see it? I think so. <laughs> Quite likely. Quite likely. He was upset. He was disappointed. Do you think any of the children rushed up to see if they could see a piece of the Ten Commandments where God's finger was, had written? That's what I would do. <laughs> do you think God instructed Moses to throw them down? No. Uh, that's a good question. To signify breaking of the... Uh, of the yeah. treaty, the covenant that they had. It, it was amazing that he was willing to do it for them again. That's for sure. Okay, Charles, you want to read yes, on sir. there? Uh, Deuteronomy 32, 19. When the Lord saw this, he was angry and rejected his sons and daughters. Good news, Bible. To show his abhorrence of their crime, he, Moses, threw down the tablets of stone and they were broken in the sight of all people, thus signifying that as they had broken their covenant with God, so God had broken His covenant with them. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 320 and paragraph 1. Okay, so that suggests that Moses did w this while they were all watching, and it specifically meant that they had broken their covenant. 
Well, God agreed to re rewrite the commandments on new tablets, on new tables of stone, so the children of Israel could have, they, could have them in their possession. Then God tried to convince the children of Israel how important it was, and still is, I would add, to obey his commandments. He reminded them of who he was. Ira? Deuteronomy 10, verses 14 to 16. To the Lord belong even the highest heavens. The earth is his also, and everything on it. But the Lord's love for your ancestors is so strong that he chose you instead of any other people, and you are still his chosen people. So then from now on, be obedient to the Lord and stop being stubborn. Good news, mm. Bible. Deuteronomy 10, verses... It's the same verses from King James. Yeah, oh, this is from yeah, King we're, James. We're, okay. So it's Deuteronomy 10, 14 to 16. And we're going to do this because our Bible study guide comments on the King James language. Okay. So from the King James, Behold, the heaven and the heavens of heavens is the Lord thy God, the earth also, with all that is there that therein is. Only the Lord had a delight in... See, this is hard for me to read. Yes. Yeah, Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them. He chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is, as it is this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Okay, now, do you think... I didn't think see circumcision or stiff-necked in the Good News Bible. No, you didn't. Under <laughs> mercy, not under grace, <laughs> not love. Well, that was my question, too. Do you think the children of Israel understood what in the world he was talking about? He talked about the circumcision of the heart. I don't know. No, well, it had to be their lingo. If not, you know, why even tell them? So yeah, would... must have been somehow or other. And stiff-necked. I think they probably understood stiff-necked. They, they, they had to know that what, very well. What does the, is it in Hebrew? Yeah. What? Well, it says quite literally those terms. Okay. And so you, you have the option. Do you, you just literally translate what it says there and let people interpret for themselves, or you try to help them by interpreting based on what you know about the, what the translators know about the situation. So that's, that's the option. Well, in these verses, God has made it very clear that an external circumcision or any other external sign would not be and is not adequate for what it was or is, what he was or is asking of his children. He needed and, and needs a new birth, a transformation of the inward motivations, motives of the heart. Do we have any divided loyalties? What might they be? But when you look at the scriptures, this is the theme that goes through the scriptures. You know, I mean, Isaiah 58. Mm -hmm. I hate whatever you bring. I don't want this stuff. Mm -hmm. I even hate your keeping of your Sabbath. And uh, Isaiah 1, he said, I don't want to even listen to your hymns anymore. I mean... So that you see this theme all along in the mm -hmm. scriptures. Well, notice what God went on to say through Moses. Deuteronomy 17, Deuteronomy 10, 17 to 19 in the Good News and then the King James. The Lord your God is supreme over all gods and over all powers. He is great and mighty, and he is to be feared. He does not show partiality, and he does not accept bribes. He makes sure that orphans and widows are treated fairly. He loves the foreigners who live with our people and gives them food and clothes. So then, show love for those foreigners, because you were once foreigners in Egypt. Okay, have the King James. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. Nor taketh reward. It is hard to read. <laughs> he doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widows and loveth the stranger. 
in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Okay, now what kind of strangers were living among the children of Israel at this point in time? I think the Egyptians, Egyptians came in. The mixed there were the mixed multitude. But they were still in the 40 years down the land. No, there probably was intermarriage. <coughs> do, you think, do you think that there were other people from other nations who heard about the children of Israel and came out to investigate and decided that this was a good way to go? Well, the Moabite so. women came out and yeah. joined them, but in a different yeah. way. And that was, yeah, that was a way, well, this is being written. Yeah. It is important for us to remember that when God called himself God of gods and Lord of lords, he was not suggesting that there are some other gods, perhaps lesser than he, somewhere else in the universe. It was simply a way to, of saying that he is supreme over all. He is the only God, and he will not be corrupted by bribes or any other means. Um, I'm not sure how good we are doing with time, but uh, here he says, uh, you are a stranger, so be nice to them. Also, he said, look, when you go there, don't have any, no treaty with this yeah. folk. Yeah. You know, so he wanted to keep them separate at the same time to be nice to them. Yeah. To be good to them, but... When that... So who are the fatherless, the widow, and the stranger in our society? What, does that include the homeless, the drunkards, the drug addicts, etc.? How should we relate to these people? Is it easy to carry the gospel to them? Um, but how does our God behave in reference to all that? Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For through him God created everything in heaven and on earth, the seen and the unseen things, including spiritual powers, lords, rulers, and authorities. Now, this is talking about Jesus. God created the whole universe through him and for him. Christ existed before all things, and in union with him all things have their proper place. There are many passages in Scripture, including Psalm 146, 5 to 10, that make it clear that God is the source of our lives. By that we mean that, that every breath and every heartbeat happens only because he makes it happen. When we say that, we're, we, what we're saying is the chemical forces, the biological forces that interact to make every breath and every heartbeat and every thought work were designed by God and they only work because God made them that way. He is a source of any healing that happens. Uh, he, gave, uh, he gives us power for the, everything that we do. Particularly challenging and interesting is what Deuteronomy 10.19 says, Therefore love the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. Aha! Now I have an excuse. I don't need to bother with that rule because I was never a mm -hmm. slave in Egypt, right? Since we have never been slaves in Egypt, does this, give us, does this verse not apply to us? Or should we think of ourselves as strangers in this sin-polluted world? Do we belong to this world? God had warned Abram 400 years earlier that his descendants would uh, pass through those terrible years of enslavement in Egypt. Jim? Genesis 17, verse 8. I will give you and, your, and to your descendants this land in which you are now a foreigner. The whole land of Canaan will belong to your descendants forever, and I will be their God. Good News Bible. Acts 13, 17. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors and made the people a great nation during the time they lived as foreigners in Egypt. God brought them out of the out, excuse me, God brought them out of Egypt by his great power. Exodus fifteen thirteen. Faithful to your promise, you led the people you had rescued. By your strength, you guided them in your sacred land, or to your sacred line. And I have to make an excuse here. I repaired that Exodus there, put the E back in, but somehow or other I didn't get it on this one anyway. It's Exodus fourteen thirteen again. Now, go ahead. Moses answered, Don't be afraid. Stand your ground, and you will see what the Lord will do to save you today. You will never see these Egyptians again. Good news, Bible. 
Have any of us, you out there, any of us here lived on the margins of society, being outcasts or slaves in a given situation? At the foot of Mount Sinai, the children of Israel had been designated by God as, quote, a people dedicated to me alone, and you will serve me as priests, Exodus 19, 6, good news Bible. But even though they may have known all the details of every religious ritual and all that God wanted them to do, that did not change their duty to honor human rights, including to for the stranger, the widow, and the orphan. So now we haven't decided who the widows. Does this mean literal widows, widows and orphans, or could that include more, some other groups? The strangers, well, does that mean, I'm sorry, the whole It would certainly include the specific ones yeah. named, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, you know, as you're suggesting, maybe it's a little bit more expansive than that. Okay, so let me give you an example. I have a patient, very faithful patient of mine, who has a lot of problems, including a child that's somewhat disabled, uh, along with a couple of other children, and her husband was abusing him, so she had to go and get a restraining order from the police to keep him away, which he qualifies as a widow. Yeah. Effectively. Okay, so those kind of questions can come up. Yeah. Well, not many of us are given the responsibility of judging any other people legally or financially, but do we criticize them and disrespect them by our attitudes and behaviors? When we see the guy standing there by the street corner holding a sign and so forth, and we say, you know, is it even right to say, I'm so glad that I'm not there? Is that disrespectful? Well, there's a... It's honest. Yeah. It's honest. There's a famous law code that we was drawn up years before Moses. And many critics of the Bible claim that Moses just got his ideas from this guy, who, of course, we, he, Moses wrote Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It was put together by a famous ancient king by the name of Hammurabi. And that code, so-called, he made legal, in that code he made legal what mothers have been saying to their children for millennia, if you do not want your brother or sister to hit you, do not hit them. If you, in other words, and then in his code, it comes out, if you don't want someone else to mistreat you, don't mistreat them. Thousands of years later, when Jesus was on this earth, he turned that command upside down. Now you might say, how come I'm quoting this? And we're talking about Deuteronomy. We'll get to that in just a moment. In Matthew 7, verse 12, Jesus said, do for others what you want them to do for you. This is the meaning of Deuteronomy, right? The law of Moses and of the teachings of the prophets. Is that what we got out of Deuteronomy? It's well, what we should have gotten, but <laughs> yeah. most of us didn't get it. I see. Well, it certainly wasn't true in the days of Jesus. They hadn't gotten it. So what's the difference between the Code of Hammurab and the command from Jesus, which he ascribed to the Law of Moses and the teaching of the prophets? The Code of Hammurabi has everything the negative. Don't do unto others what you don't want them to do to you. And Jesus' command is in the positive. Do unto others what you want them to do unto you. Now, how is that different? Is that just a, another way of stating the same thing? Or is it really different? Well, the cult of Hammurabi, the Jews basically subscribed to that. In fact, it was a, somebody 2,000 years ago, they, they says, uh, he went to one of the, the, uh, Five, the teachers, remember that one, where the, where the teacher says, well, t t t recite the law while standing on one foot. Remember that? And he says, oh, well, that's, uh, don't do to somebody what you don't want to have done to yourself, and all the rest is commentary. Yeah. So it's, uh, <laughs> but that's uh, the Jews. But it, what Jesus says, it, it, it's a positive thing. Do yeah. something. So different. If you stop and think of all the implications, what Jesus said has, is so much larger, so much more all encompassing than what Hammurabi said. So now let's get to the practical questions. Are the homeless and the street people in our day 
treated with fairness? Think of what is happening in our world today. The homeless on our streets are matched by, and I could say, after having spent many years in Africa, by whole societies in other parts of the world who are even more poor and more helpless. I mean, what do you do if you're a subsistence farmer and there's a couple years of drought? You can't grow anything. And you have nothing to eat except what you grow in your garden. Do we have a responsibility to those peoples? Did God really expect the Israelites to be a light to the nations and to treat even strangers with kindness and tenderness? Would that not have been a powerful witness to the nations around them of the superiority of their faith and their God? Isn't that the whole reason why God placed them at the junction of three continents? We believe that Adam and Eve were made in the likeness of God. Surely that includes far more than just some physical appearance. Were they supposed to love and care for their children and their descendants always in a kind and tender way? Well, did Cain treat Abel in a kind and tender way? Not really. Something came apart there, didn't it? Look at these passages from Deuteronomy. Do you see a common thread? Deuteronomy 1.16 At the time I instructed them, listen to the disputes that come up among your people. Judge every dispute fairly, whether it con concerns only your own people or involves foreigners who live among you. Good News Bible. Deuteronomy 16:19. They are not to be unjust or show partiality in their judgments, and they are not to accept bribes. For gifts blind the eyes even of the wise and honest men, and cause them to give wrong decisions. Good news Bible. Deuteronomy 24:17. Do not deprive foreigners and orphans of their rights, and do not take a widow's garment as security for the loan. Goodness Bible. Deuteronomy 27, 19. God's curse on anyone who deprives foreigners, orphans, and widows of their rights. And all the all. people will answer, Amen. Amen. They listened to that, and they responded. Well, we live in a nation supposedly committed to fairness before the law, few of us would argue with the fact that the weak, the poor, the homeless, and the outcasts do not receive the same level of justice that the more prosperous, well-educated, and connected people do. That same general truth, truth is true of nations around the world. Has there ever been, or will there ever be, a nation where even the poorest most marginalized people are treated with equal fairness before the law? You aren't suggesting that attorneys get rich people off, <laughs> Of course you? not. Jim, you wouldn't do a thing like that, would you? I'm not an attorney, so thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, you know, we've all heard stories. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a money... What did God... And then there are the public defenders that are supposedly trying to help the homeless and the poor to have the same privileges that the rich do. So now that we're talking about taking care of the foreigners and the, the, the widows and the orphans, what did God mean when he said, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy? Holy means set apart, separate. Is it, is it of any value if we learn to go through all the usual motions of practicing a, a proper religious tradition? But we do not love God and love our neighbors and act accordingly? The later prophets in the Old Testament, including several of the minor prophets, spoke out repeatedly against the ill treatment that was given to the poor and marginalized. In the days of Amos and Isaiah, for example, the poor and the needy were despised and mistreated, both in the northern kingdom of Israel, later known, known as Israel, um, which was about to be conquered by the Assyrians, I might add, and the southern kingdom of Judah with its ca capital in Jerusalem. Amos came from the southern kingdom of Judah with its, uh, I'm sorry, Amos came from the southern kingdom of Judah, but he was sent by God 
to witness to the northern kingdom of Israel. Finally, you read his book, they were, the people in the north said, go home, go back to your own country. Isaiah, a cousin of the king in Jerusalem, remained in and around Jerusalem throughout his ministry. Look at some of the words spoken by Amos, Isaiah, and even Jeremiah to throw in some more, another prophet, to describe the conditions in their world. Amos 2, uh, verse 6. The Lord says, The people of Israel have sinned again and again, and for this I will certainly punish them. They sell into slavery, slavery honest people who cannot pay their debts, the poor who cannot repay even the price of a pair of sandals. Good news, Bible. Wow. Amos 4, 1, verse 1. Listen to this, you women of Samaria who grow fat like well-fed cows of Bashan, who, who ill-treat the weak, oppress the poor, and demand that your husbands keep you supplied with liquor. Wow. <laughs> How okay. appropriate that you should read that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Amos 5, 11. You are pressed, you have oppressed the poor and robbed them of their grain. And so you will not live in the fine stone houses you build or drink wine from the beautiful vineyards you plant. And of course, that's because they're about to be overrun by the Assyrians. Isaiah 3, 14 and 15. The Lord is bringing the elders and the leaders of his people to judgment. He makes this accusation. You have plundered vineyards and your houses are full of what you have taken from the poor. You have no right to crush my people and take advantage of the poor. I, the Sovereign Lord Almighty, have spoken. Okay. Hmm. Isaiah 10, verses 1 and 2. You are doomed. You make unjust laws that oppress my people. That is how you prevent the poor from having their rights and from getting justice. That is how you take the property that belongs to widows and to orphans. Mm. Jeremiah 2, 34 and 35. Your clothes are stained with the blood of the poor and the innocent, not with the blood of burglars. But in spite of all this, you say, I am innocent. Surely the Lord is no longer angry with me. Hmm. But I, the Lord, will punish you because you deny that you have sinned. Wow. I mean, it's pretty clear what the Lord had to say to them, isn't it? Yeah. How many foreigners were living in Israel in the early days of this occupation of Palestine? How were the strangers to be treated? And let me just check here. This is a, your, your trivia question for today. What whole tribe were living in the midst of Israel? Officially approved. Have you forgotten about them? Levi? No, no, wasn't it the people that came with their with their ragged clothes and said they'd been worn out bread, for they're, they're dried out bread, months and Gibeonites. Yeah. yeah, and they end up being water carriers and uh, wood cu cutters and so forth like that. But they were officially kept in the ch for the children of Israel, and they said, "We're here. We we would rather instead of dying, we'd rather be your slaves." And there they were. Well, that might have pulled that off had they not been deceptive about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they'd have a little higher status is what I was reading. Yeah. Okay. Deuteronomy 24, 10 through 15, Good News Bible. When you lend a neighbor something, do not go into his house to get the garment he is going to give you as security. Wait outside and let him bring it to you himself. If he is poor, do not keep it overnight. Return it to him each evening so that he can have it to sleep in. Mm -hmm. Then he will be grateful and the Lord your God will be blessed with, will be pleased with you. Wow. Do not cheat poor and needy hired servants, whether fellow Israelites or foreigners living in one of your towns. Each day before sunset, pay them for that day's work. They need the money and have counted on getting it. If you do not pay them, they will cry out against you to the Lord, and you will be guilty of sin. 
Okay. Are we always fair to those who may owe us something? Or do we demand that they pay immediately? Do we pay people who serve us? Clearly, the strangers and the poor were marginalized or mistreated enormously in the countries around Israel. So it would have been quite a contrast if Israel had done what God asked them to do. But the Old Testament prophets after Moses were not the only ones who spoke out against discrimination. James 1, 27 to James 2, verse 11. When God the Father considers to be what God the Father considers to be pure and genuine religion is this: to take care of the orphans and widows in their suffering and to keep oneself from being corrupted by the world. My brothers and sisters. Now this is James, the older brother of Jesus, who ended up being sort of the titular uh, titular head of the Christian church around Jerusalem after Jesus' death. And so he says, my brothers and sisters, as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, you must never treat people in different ways according to their outward appearance. Suppose a rich man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes comes to your meeting, and a poor man in ragged clothes also comes. If you show more respect to the well-dressed man and say to him, have this best seat over here, but say to the poor man, poor man oh, you stand over there, or you can sit here on the floor by my feet, then you are guilty of creating distinctions among yourselves and of making judgments based on evil motives. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, God chose the poor people of this world to be rich in faith and to possess the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. But you dishonor the poor. Who are the ones who oppress you and drag you before the judges? The rich. They are the ones who speak evil of that good name which has been given to you. You will be doing the right thing if you obey the law of the kingdom which is found in the scripture. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But if you treat people according to their outward appearance, you are guilty of sin and the law condemns you as a lawbreaker. Now, I wonder if that has anything to do with the fashion industry. Hmm. Whoever breaks one commandment is guilty of breaking them all. For the same one who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Even if you do not commit adultery, you have become a lawbreaker if you commit murder. So, that's from the Good News Bible. We recognize that there is nothing specifically mentioned in the Ten Commandments about the poor versus the rich. However, if we practice the principles of the Ten Commandments, the loving God and loving our neighbors, there will be no problem. So what about it? Does loving your neighbor include loving the drunkards, heroin addicts, and homeless? Do we have to love them? Are we supposed to give them a hug? Well, Jesus answered the question. do more than that. I see. Jesus answered that question, who is my neighbor, by telling this story. Now, why did they ask him the question, who is my neighbor? Do you remember the details? It was debated. It, throughout. Endlessly. It, they argued about that. The Pharisees wondered if they really had to associate with the Sadducees. And the higher levels of Pharisees weren't even sure they associate with the lower levels of Pharisees. And of course, none of those people were expected to associate with the, whatever you want to call them, the poor. Common people. The common poor, people. Especially the Romans. Yeah, exactly. Well, Jim? Luke 10, 25 to 37. A teacher of the law came up and tried to trap Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to receive eternal life? Jesus answered him, what is in the scripture, excuse me, what do the scriptures say? How do you interpret them? The man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now this guy had done his homework, right? <laughs> Well, he's, he's had that memorized. Yeah. Deuteronomy. You are right, Jesus re replied. Do this and you will live. But the teacher of the law wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Uh, let's, let's, let me interrupt again for just a second. If you ask somebody a question, and they say, they give you a question back, and then you answer your own question, you sound kind of foolish, right? 
So he says, uh, but uh, 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 who is my neighbor? Okay, go ahead. Jesus answered, there was once a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, Jericho when robbers attacked him, stripped him, and beat him up, leaving him half dead. It so happened that the priest was going down that road, but when he saw the man, he walked by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite came along, went over and looked at the man, and then walked on the other side, and walked by on the other side. But the Samaritan who was traveling that way came upon the man, and when he saw him, his heart was filled with pity. He went over to him, poured oil and wine on the, his wounds and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own animal and took him to an inn where he told him, excuse me, took where him. he took care of him. The next day he, he took out two soldiers, two silver, excuse me, two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Take, take care of him, he told the innkeeper, and when you come back this way, I will pay you whatever you spend on him. And Jesus concluded, in your opinion, which, do you th of the, excuse me, which of these acts are like a neighbor toward the man attacked by the robbers? The teacher of the law answered, the one who was kind to him, Jesus replied. You go then and do the same. Good news Bible. Now I want you to notice here, he didn't even mention the name Samaritan. He did not even mention the name of Samaritan. You're saying the Jew that was answering the teacher yeah. of the law. Yeah. 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 So Ellen White added some very interesting details to that story. Carrie, you want to try those? Yeah. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Christ illustrates the nature of true religion. He shows that it consists not in systems, creeds, or rites, but in the performance of loving deeds, in bringing the greatest good to others in genuine goodness. And that's from Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 497, paragraph 1. This was no imaginary scene, but an actual occurrence, which was known to be exactly as represented. The priest and the Levite who had passed by on the other side were in the company that listened to Christ's words. Wow. Again from Ellen White, the desire of Jesus. <laughs> Do you think Jesus specifically, I'm sure, I'm sure this happened in the courtyard of the temple. I, I, but that's, I think, 95% certain. And I'm sure that Jesus waited to give this story, maybe he didn't have to wait long, until both the Levite and the priest who had passed by on the other side were in the crowd that were listening to Jesus. Yeah. Wow. Desire of Ages 499. But that's not the end of it. The Levite was of the same tribe as was the wounded, bruised sufferer. So well, this guy was not only a Jew that had been wounded, he was a Levite. Right. Yes. Okay. What's well, the difference between a priest and a Levite? It, it, it was a difference between, if you're a priest, you were supposed to be a descendant of Aaron. And the Levites were any, all the rest of the tribe of Levi, and they did all the menial jobs around the, around the place. But they, the priests were the ones who actually did the offerings. So the priest was a subset of the Levites. Yeah. yeah. Old heaven watched as the Levite passed down the road to see if his heart would be touched with human woe. As he beheld the man, he was convicted of what he ought to do, but as it was not an agreeable duty, he wished he had not come that way, so that he need not have seen the man who was wounded and bruised, naked and perishing, and in want of help from his fellow men. He passed by, you know, let me start that again. He passed on his way, persuading himself that it was none of his business and that he had no need to trouble himself over the case. Claiming to be an expositor of the law, to be a minister of sacred things, he yet passed by on the other side. That's from the Review and Herald, January 1, 1895. Wow. <clears throat> that is really incredible. So now, friends, do we, as adherents to the law and insisting that others observe the Sabbath, for example, 
do just as much to make sure that we are observing those instructions from James and Deuteronomy and the prophets, the other prophets of the Old Testament? Should we be doing what the Salvation Army is doing? Should we be establishing homeless shelters and feeding sites? Do we have opportunity even in, their, in our society to plunder the poor in one way or another? How what, could we do that? How could we do that? How would you plunder the poor? Well, not, not pay them a not, good wage? Not pay them a fair wage, for example. That would be the, uh, one of the obvious things. Ellen White has quite a few p comments about yeah. being penurious. Yeah. And uh, in fact, I think she referred to some of the uh, people in the denomination yeah. 100 yep. plus years ago. So we've got just a couple of minutes left. One of the arguments that God through Moses used with the children of Israel was that they had been slaves themselves in Egypt in the past and they knew what it was like to be slaves. Most of us today would immediately reject the idea that we have ever been slaves. But, as, but are we slaves to sin? Do you feel like you're in bondage of some kind? Should we feel that way? How would that impact the way we live? What could we do to escape that bondage? We may understand the three angels' messages, we may understand the truth about the nature of man, about hell and the mark of the beast, but if we do not know how to love and care for those around us in a respectable, respectful way, could we really claim to be Christians? Shouldn't the truth that we espouse make us particularly loving? In our day, there are situations which it could be even be dangerous to stop and help someone along the road. What should we do in such a situation? Should Seventh-day Adventists be foremost in promoting human rights? Think back to the sin that happened when the children of Israel worshipped the golden calf, even calling it Yahweh. How does it make you feel about God when he told Moses to carve out two tables of stone and take them up to the top of the mountain and he could rewrite those commandments for them and preserve them in the Ark of the Covenant box? We've already suggested that God's covenant of love is everlasting. So how could it be made new? And you know, of course, the famous passage in Jeremiah 31 where he talks about the new covenant. We don't have time to read that right now, but he did. So why, why God suggests write the laws in, in, in the hearts. So why didn't God just do that right up front? I'll leave that question with you. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we've had marvelous things to discuss here, to think about the issues that face us on a day-by-day -day basis and face them so many years ago. Help us to know how we should relate to those poor and needy and helpless, those who perhaps are homeless, those who uh, have all kinds of other problems. Help us to reach out with loving care to all of your children is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.